Colonel Robert Hogan was proud to be the squadron leader of the 504th. He had been lucky to have such a good team of men under him. He had turned down a job at the Pentagon because it was still under construction. There was a war out there and he was determined to do his part in making sure that Nazi Germany would not continue to exist. He had been approached with the idea that he would go to a Stalag 13. The prisoners there at the camp had been able to establish an espionage unit there, but were in need of a commanding officer. Their commander who had started the espionage was no longer able to do the work. The Germans had reassigned him to another camp and he had gone over the fence just a few weeks before. The mission was going to be an extremely dangerous one. It was always dangerous when a plane goes down and a pilot has to parachute out of the plane. Many a good pilot had been shot down as they tried to land in the hostile country of Germany. If the pilot did survive there was no promise that the pilot would survive once they landed in Germany. Some pilots were shot by the Germans once they were taken to Gestapo. Headquarters for questioning. Colonel Hogan was going to take over the espionage of the area around Hamelburg, Germany. Stalag 13 was run by an incompetent man by the name of Colonel Klink. Hogan was to take over the operation and under the name of Goldilocks he would keep in contact with London and help with the spying on the Germans. They would also be bringing many passengers back to their home by an elaborate escape. It was to be Hogan's last day as a free man and he knew it. He would stay at the prisoner of war camp until the prisoners were liberated and the people of the world were once more free. That was going to be his mission and at all cost he was going to stop this madman that went by the name of Adlolf. Hitler. The last briefing had been that morning. From this day on he was to be known by the name of Goldilocks and he would be in contact with submarines. As they would come into the area to provide the camp with much needed supplies. The submarine would also pick up escaping prisoners from the Stalag 13. The men of his unit had no idea what he was going to do on this cold wintry day. It was top secret and as he climbed into his plane Colonel Hogan did his best to act as though nothing different was going to happen that day. On board the plane he would carry nothing but what should be carried and everything had to be memorized. As Colonel Hogan began his fateful flight to Hamburg Germany he reflected on his life. He had been made a full colonel prior to the war and had thought seriously about taking a job at the new Pentagon. But his life had been put into an uproar with the onset of World War II. He had seen so many men go out into battle to never be seen again. The horror stories that came out of some of the front lines convinced him that they needed an inside man to help with the cause and he was the man. As his squadron approached the target city of Hamburg, Colonel Hogan allowed his ship to receive a very slight hit. But Hogan did not try to save his plane and he parachuted out over the town below. Among the fires and the guns he managed to land unscathed behind enemy lines in the town where the famous Luftwaffe Colonel Bender waited below. The colonel was sure that he would now become a general having caught the infamous Colonel Robert Edward Hogan. He had studied Hogan for many months and could not believe his luck when the man was shot and nearly landed in his lap. As Colonel Hogan landed behind the enemy lines in Hamburg he was greeted by a man named Colonel Bender. He spoke English and showed Colonel Hogan to his jeep. He was to take him to his office and question him. As he looked at the dashing man who sat next to him with a smirk. On his face he wondered why they had been able to capture him with such ease. He had ways of finding out what was going on. As they arrived at Colonel Beaton Bender's office Hogan was taken into the office. No matter what the man said the colonel would not say anything. But his name rank and serial number. My name is Robert Edward Hogan I have the rank of colonel and my serial number is 0876707. Colonel Hogan was there for the saving of many lives and he had to give out as little information as he could. He was interrogated for hours and was threatened many times. In all of the hours that he was in there he gave them no information. 
he was put in solitary and questioned for another ten days. He was not being fed well. And he was starting to get tired, but he stood by his word. Finally Colonel Hogan found himself on his way to Stalag 13, it was not a long ride, but the truck was very uncomfortable and he had many things on his mind. It would be a big change coming to the camp. As the truck pulled up he saw the wires the fence and the guard. There were a few prisoners outside watching as he arrived. Somehow he needed to get himself assigned to barracks too. The men in the barracks were his contacts and were very capable at the act of espionage. With this Colonel Hogan was taken into an office. The office was bare and the first thing that he noticed was the beautiful lady that was seated at the desk watching him intently. He smiled at her and took a seat. The driver told the lady at the desk who he had brought to meet the commandant. Colonel Clink. Colonel Hogan was sent in to meet Colonel Clink and he almost laughed at him. He was an older gentleman who had a desk that was piled with many papers. On the desk was a spiked helmet and a cigar box. Colonel Clink told Colonel Hogan to take a seat. Colonel Hogan gave the man a smile and took a seat. Colonel Clink stayed standing and looked at Hogan sharply. This is the toughest prisoner of war camp here in Germany. No one has ever escaped. And I will not tolerate any attempts. The men will be severely punished for any attempts that are made to escape he told him. I understand sir. You will not have any trouble from the men in my barracks. Just don't assign me to barracks too. The men in that barracks when. I went by looked not the good sort for a colonel like me. Colonel Clink gave him an evil smile. That is where the senior officer has always stayed. The last man that was the senior officer has been transferred. To another stalag. You will take over his old room he told him. The men of barracks too had been watching with curiosity this man they would come to know as their brave witty and future leader. They had lost the. Man who had done most of the work setting the stalag up. The camp had been set up with many things already. They had managed to steal a radio. But needed to come up with a plan on how or where to place the antenna. The barracks now had a large underground basement with a tunnel that took them to the outside of the stalag. They had cleverly hidden the escape. Tunnel in a tree trunk. The colonel actually had made part of the fence near the guard tower a place that the fence could be lifted up for short escapes. This had been used several times when the men needed to go out to meet a contact in the woods. The stalag was heavily guarded and there were floodlights that covered every corner every couple of minutes. There were guard dogs also. But, there. Man Corporal Lebeau had the dogs trained to be mean to the Germans and friendly to the Allies. As Colonel Hogan sat in the office of Colonel Klink's he observed everything. There were to be no surprises on that day or in the future. He listened. Intently to the older German colonel go on and on about his record of no escapes and while he was doing this Hogan helped himself to many cigars. This was the first time that Hogan got to meet Sergeant Schultz. Hans Schultz was a large man in his fifties. He was a blundering as the infamous. Colonel Klink. He saluted Colonel Klink and took him towards the barracks. The first impression that Hogan got of the barracks was how barren it was. Each of the men went right to picking on Schultz or Skultzi that they called him. The biggest thing that he said was I see nothing nothing. He yelled that as he left the barracks in a hurry. Hogan put his few meager supplies in the room that was to become his room for the next many years. At this time the Allies had no idea how long the War was going to last. They had high hopes that the war would end soon, but Hogan had been given no promises. His room had a bunk and one blanket. And a pillow. He had the toothbrush and comb that had been given him by the Red Cross, but that was all. He had been lucky. The Germans had allowed. Him to keep his fighter jacket. The jacket would help him keep warm on those cold winter days. He then asked to meet the following men whose names had been given to him as dependable men who could assist him in the operations that he was going to head. The men had no idea how intricate their organization was going to become. 
they had now become the heart of the espionage system. In the Hamelberg, Germany area, there were several train tracks, bridges and factories in the area and under his direction they would seek out and destroy anything that posed a threat to the Allies. The first man that he called was a Frenchman named Louis Lebeau. He had been at the camp the longest and was familiar with every tunnel and was very good with the animals. He was a small man who could fit in tiny spaces. That would be one of the most useful things that Lebeau would be used for. He was also known for his French cooking and how much he hated the Germans. The second man was a man named Corporal Peter Newkirk. This man had many talents that he had learned as he toured with a circus. He could imitate voices and with the sleight of hand he could take or give most anything that you wanted to plant or take from any German without being noticed. He was a brave man who had no fear of going out of the compound and had done so many times. The third man was Andrew Carter. He had been an officer but had traded in those clothes when he had come to stay at Stalag 13. He was a bomb and dynamite specialist. One of his favorite things to do was to work with the chemistry of weapons. He was one of the best that the Allies had on their side. And would work tirelessly to make sure that many of the staples in the area were blown up. He was a friendly American with a quick laugh. Andrew was part North Dakota Sioux and his grandfather had fought alongside Sitting Bull. He was a good addition to their group and had been brought there. Specifically to work espionage. The fourth man who had been specifically assigned to Stalag 13 was a man named Sergeant James Kinchloe. This man was the best that the Allies had on that side of the war in communication. He was brave quick and dedicated to the cause. He was outgoing and was a good addition to the team. That had been assembled some by chance and others by choice back in London. As the men came into Colonel Hogan's room they all introduced themselves and waited to hear from their new commander. There was a lot of worry. In their minds as there was much hidden underneath the barracks and they did not want a turncoat. Within minutes though, their worries were squashed. Colonel Hogan told them what he was here for. I have been sent here from London to help you with your espionage, in fact enhance it. Our work here is vital to the war effort. London became aware of your small operation and has sent me to make sure that it becomes a large operation. We will be here to destroy the enemy from within until our allies are able to come here in person he told them. Each one of the men looked at each other. They were not to trust him at once, but then Schultz came in. Newkirk went up to him for information and Schultz bragged about the colonel that had caught him and now was a general. Hogan had been the leader of a famous squadron that had been sent back to the United States. The men knew then that Hogan was for real. Each man that occupied Barracks 2 had been completely checked out and were trusted with the four men. They spoke with pride how the Barracks had done many things to the men that had entered the camp in a German uniform. They had sabotaged many cars and trucks by putting water in the gas tanks, blowing tires, and disconnecting other items. One of their favorite places to damage the vehicles had been at the repair department there. On Stalag, there was much for Colonel Hogan to learn about the operation. The first was that when you lifted the bunk bed that was located to the right of the outside door you found steps that led to a large room with a radio located in it. Then you could go to any location within the camp or to the outside. There was even an emergency tunnel. There were only three tunnels that had not finished. Kinch as he was called explained that the radio had been stolen from one of the trucks that had come into the compound. The problem was that they had no antennas so the radio was worthless. This would be the first job of the commanding officer Colonel Hogan. Somehow he was going to have to come up with a place that he could put the antenna up but a place that the Germans would not see it. Also, it was going to have to be done within the compound. The men looked to him for inspiration and as they would soon learn no problem was too difficult for the cunning Hogan. As the men took Colonel Hogan around the compound he took notes in his mind of the things in the camp. There were three guard towers that 
would use their spotlights to watch the door of barracks too. There was 20 seconds between each sweep and you had to be quick. To get caught. Outside of the barracks was very dangerous. The guards all carried guns and they would aim to kill. After a close examination of all of the different buildings and their location Hogan knew the best place to put the antenna. Unfortunately the best place to put the antenna on a building was the building that housed Colonel Klink's office. Somehow or another the men of Barracks 2 were going to need to run a wire up to the top of the roof and place an antenna that would not be spotted by anyone. The best way would be to make it retractable but that would be tricky without the problem of the location. The best way would be to have them run the line through the bottom of the floor and then up through the wall. That was going to take some extra time. The tunnel that went under the office would be of great assistance. But one of the problems would be to run the wire up through the wall. As Kinch went into Klink's office he looked around and saw the best location. For the antenna wire. There was a large bookcase on the side of the room where he could run the wire under the floor and up the wall behind. The bookcase. Once the antenna was on the roof they could easily put the antenna there. But how would they hide the antenna? Even a retractable. Antenna would be easily seen by anyone who came into the area. The men went back to the barracks to think about their next step. They now knew how to run the wire, but they were going to have to come up. With a plan to make the antenna invisible. Colonel Hogan told them let me think about this and we will work on it again in the morning. The next morning when Hogan and the men went outside for roll call Hogan took a look at the surroundings and at Klink's office building in particular the flag that now adorned the stairs. That was when the thought crossed his mind. He would go and talk to Clink right away and convince him to put the flag on the rooftop of his building. After the roll call was finished Colonel Hogan went to work with the Commandant of Stalag 13. He entered the office and Hilda allowed Colonel Hogan into the office. Colonel Clink welcomed him into the office. Colonel Hogan again took a couple of cigars from the cigar box and took a seat. Putting his feet up on the desk. Clink told him to put his feet down and Hogan lit one of the cigars ignoring the man but putting his feet down. Just to make the other colonel feel as though he was running the show. I have been very impressed with your camp colonel. It is well run and the men here both respect and fear you. They know that you run the toughest prisoner of war camp in Germany and are afraid of escaping or attempting to escape. But I was wondering about something. You have a flag but you raise it every morning and hang it on your porch. Why don't you have a permanent flag up on the roof for all to see? Colonel Klink looked at Hogan with suspicious eyes. Why would you care where we leave our flag? He asked. I have just been looking over the camp and I was just wondering. If you want to take the flag down every day that is fine with me. My men don't want to look at the Nazi flag every day either. Colonel Hogan told him. Hogan watched the man as he thought about the prospect of moving the flag and told him. The roof is not that high up and your men could do it easily. They probably would not get hurt, but they could fall for sure. I am glad that my men won't be climbing up there. Hogan told him. UMM it could definitely be dangerous. But it would not take that long and it would keep a couple of the prisoners busy for a while. I will not order the prisoners to do it but would take a couple of volunteers. They would be paid with an extra shower. Clink offered him. You are true to your reputation Colonel Clink. You are stern but fair. I will ask my men and find two or three of them to help with the raising of your flag. The flag will fly high above your building day or night, no matter what we think. Hogan said while he was smiling to himself. What a dumb man he thought. When can your men start on the flag? Clink asked Hogan. I will get two of my men maybe even three to do it tomorrow. If that is all right with you. Hogan promised him. As Colonel Hogan went into his barracks he had a smile on his face. Clink was a pushover and when his men went out to Clink's office tonight they 
would run the wire and get ready for the next day when they would put up the antenna. Meanwhile Carter and Kinch had been busy preparing the antenna and fixing a special type of retractable one. Carter made a piece that could easily raise and lower the antenna quickly if it became necessary. It was Hogan's hope that they could hide the antenna behind the flag so that even when it was raised it would not show. Kinch came up with an ingenious idea. He would put a large ball on the flagpole. It would distract from the antenna and would also help boost the signal. Their main contact was going to be a submarine that came into range about once a week. Perhaps with a stronger signal they would be able to reach the submarine more often. That evening the men went to Colonel Klink's office and after just a half hour's work they were successful in running the wire up to the top of the roof where the flagpole was going to be placed. It was dangerous work as the guards went by the office often and if they spotted the flashlights that Hogan and his men were using their time would be over. So at the window stood Lebo. He stood there and watched as Kinch and Newkirk and Hogan worked to run the wire through the wall and then replace the bookcase. The wire was well hidden and would not be seen. Unless someone moved the bookcase. Hogan thought about it and knew that he would have to convince Clink to make the bookcase a permanent fixture so that it would not be moved accidentally. The man ran the wire down through the tunnel and there they connected the radio getting ready for the new antenna. The device that would lift. The antenna up and down was installed just below the barracks and the radio was ready for use as soon as the antenna was put up. Each time it was raised someone would have to manually pump it up, but it would work. The next morning after the men had stood for roll call Kinch and Newkirk volunteered to place the flag on the rooftop. Carter and Lebeau stayed on the ground acting as though they were watching the men in case one of the men slipped but they were making sure that none of the Germans were aware of what was really going on. In Klink's office Hogan was keeping the German busy. I was wondering about that large bookcase over there. It is so large and could fall over. If not anchored right. Did you mount that correctly? Hogan asked him. Mount? Well I am not sure Klink stuttered. Well since you have given my men extra showers in thanks for them putting up the flag I will have them fix the bookcase for you. Hogan told him. Colonel Klink looked at the man he had just met and told him thanks. With that Colonel Hogan left the office. Once more he had taken some cigars from the box and was smiling like a Cheshire cat. As he walked out. Of the building he saw that his men were done and they nodded to him to let him know that it had worked out alright. As Colonel Hogan walked into the barracks and went down into the tunnel he saw Kinch ready to make a call to the submarine that was supposed to be arriving within range of the radio shortly. Colonel Hogan picked up the microphone and said Goldilocks to Mama Bear. Within just a few moments he heard the return of This is Mama Bear go ahead Goldilocks and a new era began.